Hello and welcome to Senior Living Live. I'm Janae Sherman and I appreciate you taking the time to be with us for our webinar today. Our topic today is designed to inspire caregivers with a variety of engaging ideas for their loved ones with dementia. Our presenter today is Marianne Bazurgi, and she is the Chief Growth and Innovation Officer of Ugeria. In just a moment, she will be providing us with some hands-on activities and ideas, but before I give her the floor, I just want to remind you that if you have a question, please type it in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and I'll be happy to read those to Marianne after she's completed her presentation. Marianne, thanks for joining us today. Take it away. It's all yours. Thank you, Janae. Thank you for having me, and thank you to all of you who've joined uh, the webinar today. I hope this will be an inspiring session. Um, as Janae mentioned, I work at Ugeria, and within that company, my role is Chief Growth and Innovation Officer. So to give you a little bit of background, at Ugeria, um, what we do is we find products that are useful, dignifying, and innovative for people living with dementia. And we have a clear social mission. That is to um, make sure that people living with dementia can uh, do so with um, dignity, and we believe that technology has a role to play. And so in, um, in my work, I come across a lot of different products and a lot of uh, caregivers that help me uh, test different innovations. And so I understand when activities are usually helpful and useful when you're living or taking care of someone with uh, dementia. And so I'm happy to uh, share what I've learned so far in my career uh, today. Um, if um, at any point you have any questions, as Janae mentioned, feel free to write them in the q and I want this to be dynamic, helpful, and useful for you, and um, I'll be happy to answer any that you might have. Um, I thought I would start this presentation by um, just explaining that I am um, not a physician, and so if you do have questions about your loved one that has dementia, I highly encourage you to reach out to your doctor, ask her questions. But there are also a lot of resources out there to um, help you and, and regarding the topic that we're talking about today, which is activities and cognitive stimulation for your loved one with dementia. There are a lot of organizations that can help you find activities that are relevant uh, for them. And so if you don't already know them, I thought I would start out by uh, mentioning a few of them. Of course, your local Alzheimer's Society has a ton of programs that you can participate in. You can um, get some education. You can also get uh, uh, be part of a support group to um, learn um, and, and get some support from other people that are living in the same uh, situation as you. And um, they have a lot of content on their website as well. So uh, make sure you check out Alzheimer's Society for a plethora of information to help you and your loved one. There's also a charity called Hilarity for Charity, which um, has a lot of activities, resources, and support groups for caregivers. And so I encourage you to um, Google their name, Hilarity for Charity. And um, a favorite of mine is uh, Tipa Snow. Tipa Snow is an occupational therapist and she provides uh, training, um, lots of YouTube videos, lots of uh, books that she wrote on a positive approach to care. And so she has a lot of ideas of how you can engage with your loved one, how you can have meaningful connection, meaningful conversations with them. Um, and I'm sure that you'll, um, you'll learn a lot just by uh, reading up a little bit about, um, about her approach. So again, um, very excited to share some of my ideas with you today, but there are a lot of resources out there to help you, to help your loved one. Um, and I hope that uh, this is the start of your journey as you discover how to provide cognitive stimulation to your loved one uh, with dementia. So why are we talking about cognitive stimulation and activities? Well, it's because whether or not someone has a diagnostic of dementia, it has been proven that it is very beneficial for the brain to have um, regular physical activity and mental stimulation. So that's true before a diagnostic and even after a diagnostic. So the goal is really being healthy in a well-rounded way. We're not talking about 
you know, becoming a, um, a an athlete that does a ton of physical activity, or we're not talking about becoming a chess master that wins championship. We're just talking about finding activities that really fill your cup and give your loved one energy, give your loved one uh, the feeling of um, accomplishment and uh, positive, um, positive emotions. So um, what I wanted to uh, chat a little bit about today are first the different types of stimulation that are beneficial. So the first one, I already mentioned it, is physical activity. Moving regularly um, is something that is beneficial for the body and the brain. There are many studies that have shown that even spending as little as 30 minutes outside in nature is um, has some positive long lasting effects on your well being. And so make sure that if you're thinking about activities that you can do with your loved one, try to incorporate an activity that you can do outside and while you're moving because the body remembers and even doesn't have to be a marathon. It can be a walk in your neighborhood. It can be spending a little bit of that time outside in your garden and that kind of movement, physical activity will be good. Second type of activity um, is of course men mental stimulation. So we're really talking about working those neurons in your brain, learning something new. That's really the challenge. So um, lots of time people think mental stimulation as doing a word puzzle or a Sudoku. But it doesn't have to be just that. If, if you don't enjoy Sudoku or um, word games, um, it's really about learning something new that makes your brain develop new neuro pathways. And so it can be if you've never baked a cake, you can bake a cake for the first time, or you can try a bit more challenging recipe that you have seen on the British Bake Off and, and uh, you think, oh, that would be challenging. Kind of go outside of your comfort zone and that will be beneficial for your brain because you are doing something new. Um, mental stimulation uh, comes in many different ways. The important thing is to do something that you enjoy and that your loved one enjoys. And so I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but mental stimulation is the second type of mental act of the stimulation that we encourage that you build into um, the activities that you're scheduling uh, for loved one that has dementia. The third type of stimulation is social interaction. So um, we all saw through uh, the pandemic that being isolated was something that was hard on the morale. And so again, whether you have a diagnostic of dementia or you don't, it's really important to have in your schedule regular moments where you can meet with friends, family, neighbors, and socialize. Often following a diagnostic, of dementia, there might be some hesitation to um, enter these social um, interactions because there might be some kind of discomfort or the person that has um, is starting to feel some of the effects of dementia might feel self-conscious. And so make sure that you create the right environment um, that is safe with loved ones um, that might know about the diagnostic and so might not be surprised if uh, the same questions are asked twice, but social interactions are really important. And um, there is no right or wrong way to have a social interaction as, um, as someone who um, has dementia might, um, in, might engage socially in a slightly different way than they would before the diagnostic. I usually encourage people to, um, to jump into the conversation and, um, and kind of get into the other person's reality. So what I mean by that is um, someone that has dementia in a social interaction might say something like, my dad went fishing this morning. Now, you might know that their dad has passed away a few years ago. And often I get the question of, should I lie? 
to this person or should I tell them your dad passed away he's not gone fishing you're wrong now I consider this kind of going into their reality and the reason why they're talking about their dad might be because they saw someone with a fishing rod as they were driving to the social event and so go into their reality and continue the conversation without necessarily directly lying to them, right? So you could say something like, oh, really? Where do you like to fish? Do you prefer lakes or river? Have you ever caught a fish before? What was your favorite memory of going fishing with your dad? And so um, having that connection of um, on a certain topic, it doesn't matter if the statement is um, inaccurate. Your job is not to fact check in, in that specific social interaction. Your job is to engage and continue the conversation. And so use the, the statement, even though it might be false, as a, as a starting point or as a topic of conversation and, 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 and go from there. The last type of uh, stimulation that I think is important to include in um, any kind of activity plan that you're building is sensory stimulation. And that really becomes important as the disease progresses. And if you have someone who's in the later stages of dementia, um, sensory stimulation tends to be something that is very beneficial. What do I mean by sensory stimulation? Well, the five senses, right? The sight, um, hearing, smell, taste, and touch. And so you might be able to create an activity that uses smell. So if you, um, if you try to create maybe uh, different um, um, essential oils that recreate different smells, you can, have, um, you can have a guess that smell activity. Or with touch, you could prepare different fabrics that have different textures. And that can be something that they explore if there's a, a few different fabrics in front of them. Again, sound, music, you know that music is um, very helpful um, to, to anyone. It has kind of a direct path to your, your emotions and your heart. And so finding activities that you can do around music can be really, really impactful. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is just kind of a, a a few examples of what you can do in terms of sensory stimulation, but if I summarize, right, the four types of stimulation that you should think about as you're thinking of cognitive um, stimulation for your loved one that has dementia, it's uh, physical, mental, social, and sensory. Now, what I wanted to do is, uh, before I give you a few examples, of activities that you can do with your loved one. I wanted to talk about um, how you can make a um, conscious decision on the type of activity you choose for your loved one. Because it has to be really, um, when you think of an activity, you have to think of an activity that is relevant, that is interesting, that is gonna be enjoyable for that person. Because when you have met someone with dementia, you've met one person with dementia. And so they have a whole life story behind it. So they have a lifetime of preferences, of experiences. And so it's not because they now have a dementia diagnosis that all of a sudden they will like all activities that are labeled as for people with dementia. Someone who their entire lives has never done a puzzle probably will not enjoy doing puzzles even after they have a dementia diagnosis. So really try to identify, even as I'm gonna give you a lot of different ideas, try to identify what it is that the person likes to do in their free time. Before the diagnosis, what do they enjoy? And then try to see how you can adapt that activity for it to be safe, for it to be an appropriate level of difficulty now that this person has had a diagnosis of dementia. But you're more likely to succeed if you start with an activity that they have enjoyed their whole life when you slightly modify it to make it something that they can succeed at now that they have 
a bit more of a challenge in, in completing activities. I hope this has been helpful so far. I'm just gonna take a sip of water and see if there are any questions before I continue. Make sure to write them in the Q&A if I can help. Okay. So what I wanted to do next is talk about some of the activities that you could do with your loved one. I thought I would start about them as being art-based, logic-based, outdoors, and then indoors. Those are kind of the category of activities that I have prepared for you. Starting with art-based, you can do a lot of things around music. If your loved one has enjoyed playing music, um, you might be surprised that they still might be able to play music long after they get a dementia diagnosis. If for some reason the instrument that they were able to play, they are no longer able to play, try to find a simple instrument, maybe a triangle, maybe a, a percussion, like a tambourine, so that they can uh, mark the rhythm as they're uh, listening to a, a, a music or a, a song. Really having them participate and have a job, which is to, to play an instrument, is going to be something that is extremely enjoyable for them. Now, I myself don't play music, but really enjoy listening to music. And so another activity that you could do is you could prepare a playlist of their favorite song. And think about the songs that are meaningful for them in their lives. Maybe the first song that they danced to, or their first, the song that played at their wedding, or songs that they enjoyed in their childhood. Because we know that with dementia, often memories from earlier in your life stay intact for much longer than the memories that you've made in the past couple of years. And so preparing a playlist of music, maybe you wanna burn a CD or you wanna put it on a USB stick, and bring it so that they can play on their radio will be a really fun way for you to spend an hour kind of sitting, listening to the songs, maybe singing the songs if they remember the lyrics, or maybe just reminiscing and talking about what these songs uh, bring as souvenir and as memories. Um, now going still in the art uh, based type of activities. Um, if your loved one was someone who their whole life enjoyed painting or um, sculptures or making pottery, that is definitely something you can continue to plan as an activity together. Now, there are some, um, some activities that exist that can make your life a little bit easier because painting with all the different paints might involve a lot of cleaning up for you. And so I encourage you to look into uh, water-based paint um, and where you can only use water and a paintbrush to paint an image and that makes the colors appear. There are um, lots and lots of books or activity books that can uh, provide you with this activity. And as I said, there is not a lot of cleanup required from you. And if uh, there's a spill, it's just a spill of water, which is a bit less hard to clean up than paint. Um, something else that you can uh, do in terms of activity is really around photos. So you can either build photo albums together or flip through photo albums. And again, use it as an opportunity to reminisce, talk about what they're seeing, who they're recognizing. And again, just like in the uh, social stimulation that we were talking about earlier, your job is not to fact check as you're flipping through the family photo albums. If they identify someone as an uncle and you know it's not an uncle, that's okay. You can, you can just have them talk about, oh, and were you having a barbecue in that photo? What do you like to have on the barbecue? Really use the photos as a starting point for the conversation. Don't use the photos as a fact check or as a memory test to make sure that they can identify the correct person with a name. 
Um, something else that you could do if you don't have family photo albums or for some reason you don't think something that they would enjoy, you can build binders of photos for them. Often as um, the dementia disease progresses, sometimes people will start to develop an affinity for a certain topics. So what I mean by that is they might really enjoy cat photos or baby photos or uh, photos of uh, farmhouses. So you could go to the local library, print a lot of those um, images and put them together in a binder and give that to them as a gift. And you'll find that they might want to sit down and look through the photos of the kittens for 20 to 30 minutes and that could be a pleasant calm activity that you do together. Are there any questions around the art-based activities that I've talked about so far, whether it's music, painting, or photo? So the second type of activity I wanted to um, chat to you about are logic-based. So if you think about um, puzzles, or word-based games, whether it's, um, you know, uh, um, some of the puzzles that you do in the, in, in, in the newspapers on the weekends, or reading, or card games. Those are all activities that you can definitely still do even after a diagnosis. So let's take puzzles. Now I'm not talking about taking 100 pieces puzzle and dumping all the pieces on a table and then saying, okay, you have three hours to complete this activity, enjoy yourself. You might need to adapt it a little bit given that um, your loved one is having some, some cognitive challenges. One of the things that you can do, of course, is go for a smaller number of puzzle pieces, right? You can go for 30 pieces. And if he's still he or she is still able to do that by themselves, great. Now, keep in mind that dementia is a disease that evolves. And so for a couple of weeks or months, they might be able to do the 30 uh, piece puzzle. But then after a bit of time, you might need to transition to 15 pieces or to 10 pieces. So um, you have to know that it is something that you have to constantly be mindful of and potentially adapt. Another way that you can adapt puzzles is by um, making some uh, some slight adjustments and uh, um, um, helping your loved one. So take for example, the 30 piece puzzle, you might need to prepare the activity by identifying, let's say, all of the pieces that are on the on, on, on all four sides. And you can give your loved one only those pieces first. And so they have a manageable task, which is probably a lot less than 30 pieces, maybe 10, but all of them are along the edges of the puzzle. And so you give them only those pieces and as they're finished, the edge of the puzzle, then you can probably give them the pieces that you've identified that fit in the top right corner. And so imagine that you kind of prepare the activity by creating four or five different piles and you only give them the next pile once they've been successful at finishing the, the, the first pile that you gave them. And so that way, the person is still completing a puzzle just in manageable pieces and manageable steps. So you could give the edges first, the top right corner, the bottom right corner, the bottom left, and the top left. Again, it's a little bit more manageable than just giving them all of the pieces and having them figure out that they need to sort them out in order for them to be able to assemble the puzzle. Another type of logic-based activity that you could do is, of course, word-based games. They might not be able to do the Sunday Times crossword puzzle anymore, but you might be able to find activity books that have lower levels of difficulty and large letters, because they might also have a hard time seeing small letters in the, um, in, in the newspaper. So again, it's about finding an activity that they loved, but adapting it to the level of difficulty that is appropriate for them now and where they are. 
if they are someone who enjoyed reading, try to find books written specifically for people living with dementia. These books exist. They are stories that are simple to follow, kind of a one storyline with large fonts and even prompts to turn the pages. And so that way the person can still enjoy sitting outside in their backyard reading. It's just a book that is a little bit easier for them to read. The reason why I like books written for people with dementia is because you can find books that are easier to read in the uh, youth section of the library, but they might not be themes that are interesting for an adult of a certain age. So the books written for people with dementia, I think are really interesting because they will be stories that are interesting to them, but with a level of difficulty that is appropriate. Finally, if your loved one has loved playing card games their whole life, I really encourage you to find um, either card games that are adapted for people with dementia, again, those exist, or to find large cards. If, you're a if you see that your loved one has a hard time reading or seeing the small numbers on the existing cards, and think about what games you would play with uh, younger kids where the rules are simple, there might be one, one goal, not kind of multiple strategies going on. And I'm sure that you'll be able to find one game that they're still able to play and enjoy. And playing card games is wonderful because it is all kinds of cognitive stimulation. You get the social aspect because you're playing in a group. You're also having a bit of mental stimulation because there's a bit of logic going on. So it's a great activity to, um, to continue to do with your loved one. Again, you might not be able to play bridge or a complex game with a complex set of rules, but you might be able to play solitaire with them. The other type of activity I wanted to talk to you is outdoor activity. Now, at the beginning of my presentation, I talked about the importance of physical activity and I have talked a little bit about going outside for a walk or gardening, but this, I cannot emphasize how important it is to spend some time outdoors. Whether it's going for a walk, gardening, um, or enjoying nature, it's, it's, it's all kinds of activities you can do, and you can do in a large group with your family, with your friends, and so you don't have all the responsibility on your shoulders to, to lead the activity. Things you can do outside, of course, you can garden, but if you don't have a garden, I still encourage you to have plants and give your loved one the job of watering the plants. Now, if you think about um, the dementia disease, it is one of a lot of small losses for the person that um, has the diagnosis. They go from being completely autonomous, independent, to a little bit over time, not being able to do things anymore. And so giving them a job like watering plants can be very fulfilling because they have the feeling of taking care of something else, which let's be honest, our whole lives as adults, we take care of other people, whether it's taking care of our children, our pets, our parents. And so it can be really jarring for someone to be in the position where all of a sudden because of a diagnosis, they have to be taken care of. And so um, try to find when you're looking for activities, try to find ways of giving them a real job because it will bring meaning um, to, a, um, to a specific activity and it is really good for self-confidence. And so if you think about gardening or having an indoor, a few set of potted plants, giving them the job of watering can be something that can be, can be very fulfilling. Um, doesn't have to be a fancy garden. You can also give them a job of raking leaves in the backyard. That's a very physically active um, activity and, um, and you're spending time outside and you're moving, and so all good things. You can also make sure that you have a bird feeder and you can just enjoy watching the birds in your backyard. The other type of activity I wanted to talk to you was um, indoors. So for that, I've um, identified things that you can do in the kitchen, but also, of course, um, outside of the kitchen. Now, um, cooking is, is really something that um, we do our entire lives. And so um, I believe that it's important to continue to help the person 
even with a dementia diagnosis, to continue to have an active role in the kitchen if it is something that they've done their whole lives. Now, um, if you think of someone who maybe was uh, very active in the kitchen, they might still be able to enjoy um, to enjoy making a ready-made mix, whether it's for like um, muffins or cakes. Um, you can still have them be, uh, be, be someone who's active in the kitchen with a little bit of help, right? Instead of starting from uh, ingredients from scratch, they might be able to start from a ready-made mix and with your help st still be able to bake muffins or a cake. Um, now you can also give them the job of washing and drying the dishes. That could be a very repetitive um, activity to do, but if you give them that job and it's, it's kind of a very simple two-step activity and they can still feel like they're contributing to the household by helping wash and, and dry the dishes. And um, another job that you can give them is setting the table. You can find online uh, placemats that have an outline of the fork, the spoon, and the knife, as well as the plate and the glass. And so that can be helpful if they are sometimes a little bit confused as to um, what does setting the table mean, right? So you can have all of the cutlery out and then you can show them that all they have to do is match the fork to the outline that's on the, on the table mat. With all of these activities around cooking, it's really important to think about how you can deconstruct in, in small steps a complex activity. So a little bit like I was telling you for the puzzles, right? For cooking, think about how you can make it a one step at a time activity to really make sure that they uh, are successful. So what that means is if, uh, for example, someone enjoyed making salads their whole lives, now that they have um, dementia, you might not be able to just write on a post-it, hey mom, please make a salad for tonight's dinner. But what you might have to do is in a little basket, you put the lettuce head, the tomato, the cucumber, the salad dressing and a knife, and you put that little basket in the fridge. And on that basket in the fridge, you put a little post-it note that says, hi mom, please cut. And so when she opens the fridge, she sees this, takes it out, and everything that she needs to do is already there. She does not need to think about making a salad, opening the door, looking for the ingredients in the fridge, bringing those on the countertop, thinking about getting a knife, and then chopping them. You see how something simple like making a salad because it involves multiple steps can not be easy for someone with dementia. Um, they, it, it might be hard for them to do. But if you try to make it kind of a one step activity, that's where they can be successful and feel really proud um, about their contribution to the household. Um, I kind of wanted to, um, to wrap up a little bit by um, giving a message right to, to, to you, the caregivers, to say that it's really important when you're thinking about um, kind of activities to do for your loved one, that you also take time for yourself. Now, stimulation is really important for your loved one before and even after a diagnosis, but it's also really important that you stay healthy and that you stay fit in order to take good care of them for a really long time. And so make sure that you, from the moment that you have a diagnosis, that you get a strong support around yourself. Many people that can help you um, and lots of resources because there's gonna be some ups and downs. And it's really important that you have a network, a loving network around you to help you through um, the next couple of years. That can mean a few different things. It can be people in your neighborhood, it can be friends, it can be family, but it can also be people that you meet at different support groups. Like I was mentioning at the beginning, Hilarity for Charity, Alzheimer's Societies, or uh, Tipa Snow or other trainings that you might discover as you research on the internet. Um, but really having a support network is important because 
they will help you sometimes do activities like the ones we've been talking about, but you might also sometimes need a break and you might need time by yourself. Um, and they might be able to come in and take care of your loved one for half a day or a couple hours just to make sure that you have time to recharge your batteries. So making sure that you build a network around yourself is really, really important. And then when it comes to the activities themselves, be patient. It's not because you try one activity one day and it fails, then you have to throw this one in the trash and never try it again. That day might not be a good day. They might, um, your loved one might be tired, might be cranky. Just sometimes it's worth it to try something two or three times before really saying, okay, no, this does not work for them. Um, and, um, and just kind of be patient and, and, and introduce it again in a different setting and it might work that day. And if you're feeling frustrated because you're trying to do an activity and it's not working, it's okay for you to take a second, leave the room, breathe a few times, calm down, not get frustrated before you go back in. Because if you really try to like just stay in there, that's when tempers might, might, might rise and it might be um, emotional. And so it's okay for you to take a step back, take a breather before you re-engage. Yes, Marianne, thank you so much, because these are some great ideas. And we do have a few questions already in here for you. So if you're watching and you do still have a question, please make sure you get it in, because we're going to try to go to the top of the hour, but you want to make sure to get those questions answered while we still have her live in the webinar. So the first question here is from Rebecca Smith, and she asked, if we can add the three resources you spoke at the beginning of the presentation. And I um, just to let everyone know, you will get this recording um, to the email that you registered with. But just so that we have that here, I'll go ahead and type those in. If you will, oh, if you're already typing them in for us, um, if you could just go over those three things again, we really appreciate that. Absolutely. I was just quickly typing them. Um, hopefully you can all see them. So the first one I mentioned was your local Alzheimer's Society. So Alzheimer's Society are um, organizations that are present across the US. They have local chapters. And what they do is both, uh, it's actually threefold. They do research, they do um, education, and then they do uh, support. So in terms of research, they try to fund a lot of research around Alzheimer prevention and Alzheimer treatment. Um, they also do a lot of education. So um, when you get a diagnosis, you're able to, you're, you or your loved one is able to take a class with the Alzheimer's Society to understand a little bit what um, dementia is, what are the different stages of the disease, what to expect. Um, so you really kind of become smart about uh, dementia as a disease. And then the third thing that you do is support. So you might've heard of um, Alzheimer's uh, coffee, um, coffee uh, chats, and that's kind of where a lot of the caregivers meet together to um, share their experiences. Often it's kind of a, a really neat moment to um, share what you've, what you've been living. If you have questions, you can ask questions, but you're really kind of in a safe space with people that are living the same thing. They're taking care of loved ones with dementia. And so you're really able to um, build a network of people that are living the same thing as you, and they might be able to share advice, but also just be a, a you know, a friend that can, uh, um, understand what you're going through and, and provide a, um, a, a helpful support. Thank you. And that those answers are in there. So now we can refer back to those. So thank you very much for that. So the next question comes from B Watson and she says that she has a loved one who didn't really do a lot of activities before diagnosis. So how can she engage him in activities now if yeah. she doesn't know what he was interested in before. Oh, and I, I completely understand, right? Because a lot of the time we, um, we're so busy with life, we work and then we get home, take care of the kids. And then, so it might be hard for people to have developed really, really um, deep kind of hobbies and things like that. And so if, uh, for, for, for B, what I would say is, um, what was his job, right? What did he spend kind of eight hours a day doing? If he was someone who was a mechanic, try to think of kind of um, activities that he can do with his hands, whether it's kind of um, twisting um, screws or, or nailing things as long as it's safe, 
um, if it was if he was someone who was an academic, right, that was like sitting at a desk, uh, reading a lot, try to find um, trying to find magazines that you can give him with a highlighter and tell him like, oh, can you read this and, and kind of summarize it to me? They might read and not be able to summarize, but the, the motion of being kind of seated at a desk, highlighting is gonna be so familiar for them that it's gonna be soothing. So I would kind of encourage you to ask for yourself, what did he spend his time doing? Even if kind of, when you think about his hobbies, you're like, I can't think of any hobby, try to think about how he spent his time um, and and trying to find activities that you can do that reflect how he invested his time when uh, before he had um, uh, dementia. Thank you. That's a good one. Actually, B has a second one, and says that her loved one also has limited mobility, uh, use of one hand, and not walking. So, what kind of activities or jobs can you think of for this situation? Um, and so a lot of the activities you can adapt. Um, if someone cannot walk, try to make sure that they have a really comfortable wheelchair so that you're able to have them be outside, but also be indoors in a way that is comfortable for them. And then um, if they only have the use of one hand, you can still do a lot of the activities that we talked about, you know, in terms of like painting or puzzles, they might just need a bit more help right, to complete the activity. And you might need to adapt the activity a little bit more. So um, if you're thinking about painting, for example, try to not buy a very thin paintbrush. Try to find one that is like thick and easy to take hold of because if they, um, if they had a stroke and they lost use of kind of one side and it's the other side that they were most comfortable with, well, they might need to kind of relearn how to hold things. And so giving them something that is easy to hold that doesn't require like very fine dexterity um, might be helpful. Same thing with the puzzles. Probably don't go for like the tiny, very thin puzzle pieces. Go for ones that are big, easy to take a hold of. Um, and so try to make it um, easy, both in terms of like level of difficulty, but also in terms of like holding and, and make sure that it is something that they're able to as autonomously as possible, be able to like, to hold um, on their own. Thank you, that makes sense. So Bob Scarpetti has a question. What special activities do you recommend during sundown? Yes, um, so for those who don't know, sundowning is um, something that a lot of people with dementia will experience. And it is a state of agitation or anxiety that they will feel right about three or 4 p.m when the sun comes down. So that's why we call it sundowning because um, kind of the day is done. And um, to be honest, as adults, our whole lives, that's usually when we kind of start to wrap up work, get ready uh, to transition to home or to pick up the kids. Um, and and so we know that there's kind of a, a second kind of half to our day that is probably more kind of um, different than at work. But then people with dementia, of course, um, know that they're supposed to transition to something, but if they're living in a nursing home, they're staying where they are. If they're at a day center, they want to be picked up now, but it's not the right time for them to be picked up. Or if they're at home, well, they feel like they need to go home because they might think that they're at work. And so it really is a time of day where they're going to feel anxiety, confusion, frustration, and it can be really challenging for um, for the caregiver to manage. Um, what I usually recommend is I recommend acknowledging, you know, so if someone says, I want to go home, my bus is here, I'm gonna miss my bus, I need to go. You can tell them, yes, yes, your bus is coming. I've been watching for it. It's not here yet. So you acknowledge that there's a bus coming and, and you're going to help them watch the bus, but then give them a job. Say something like, while we wait for the bus, can you help me sort through this pile of dirty laundry, you know, or sort through or, or, or fold this pile of clean laundry? Or can you help me rake some leaves? Or can you help me prepare dinner? So um, try to acknowledge whatever it is they're saying they need to be doing. And that's usually gonna be, um, they wanna go somewhere or they, um, they're done. Say, yes, yep, I understand you're done. 
we're, we're working towards that. But in the meantime, can you help me with this and give them a job? And that can be the activity that you do. Typically, you want to do an activity that's going to help them calm down. So that's not when I would encourage you to start do your aerobics class that is just going to like pump up the adrenaline and have everyone kind of be very active. Um, I would try and focus on a calming activity that can have them be focused, um, you know, in the moment and present. And um, that usually will help you. But um, also know that there's going to be days where sundowning is is more challenging than than others. Um, especially, I would say, if um, if you're able to have a lot of daylight, that usually um, helps um, make sure that um, that sundowning kind of uh, happens at the right moment of day. If um, if you're able to have a person kind of feel the transition from there's light out to kind of it's the evening and it's time to get ready for dinner, that usually um, that usually helps a little bit. Thank you. Uh, we still have about 10 minutes left in our webinar. So while we wait to see if anyone else has any more questions, I when you were talking about planning social interaction, you mentioned family and keeping a safe environment. What is your recommendation about interacting with cognitive peers as they progress through dementia? Hmm. Um, I have been to a lot of events organized by Alzheimer's societies where, um, where they will in a, in a room have, um, sometimes what they call kind of, um, coffee chats. And so they'll invite, um, people with different levels of, um, dementia, be able to have coffee, have a, you know, uh, a, a, a cup of tea or, or have some cake and, and cookies together. And, um, and it's it, beautiful exchanges happen there because there's almost less judgment, um, you know, in, in, in those kinds of interactions. And so if, um, if you are part of a support group where um, you know that there's um, maybe uh, people that have dementia and people that don't have dementia, you can, I definitely encourage you to try going to um, those kinds of events because um, your loved one with dementia might, um, might feel a bit more secure and safe to engage in the social interaction, um, knowing that there's uh, people who kind of understand what's kind of what's happening in the situation they're in and might be less prone to judgment. And so um, really the important is the important thing is to, as I said, respect the person and, and who they are as an individual. If, um, if the person is a very strong extrovert, you're probably safe to keep going to big family barbecues. If the person is a strong introvert, that's not gonna change after, um, after a diagnosis for dementia. And so probably safer to plan for social interactions to happen, you know, in a smaller group with people that he already knows that, that, that he has a, a strong uh, relationship with. So to really kind of not change from what is their normal, um, normal way of, of um, of, of liking to get social interactions. Thank you. I'm just about to ask something, but a question just popped up. My dad is a Ruby in the GEMS classification system. A visit to the barber shop has always been a special activity for us, but he now has delirium after each visit to the barber shop. I would say that three, four, three fourths of the experience is pleasant and enjoyed and he is excited to go to the barber shop and be engaged with his barber. It's only upon return that things go poorly. So when will he know that this is no longer an appropriate activity mm -hmm. for his father? Yeah. Oh, that's a difficult one. Um, Cause it's, it's, it's one about trade-offs. So I understand that in the moment when he's at the barber shop, it's a positive experience. But then after the fact, when he goes home, when he goes to the nursing home, that's when he probably feels distress or anxiety. Um, and so I would say, I don't think you're going to like my answer. I was going to say it's it's a judgment call. If um, if you see that in the moment he's enjoying it so much that it's worth the you know the 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 stress afterwards after going back to the nursing home it might be worth it for you to continue a little bit longer. If you see that it's, it's causing more distress than it's causing kind of benefits, um, it, 
might not be the right thing for for him to do anymore but it's it's really hard to say um i wonder if if you're able to get a little bit more information from the nursing home to might they be able to understand what's causing the distress when he's going back to the nursing home if there's um because if he's enjoying the activity so much i'm i'm almost tempted to try and find if there's something different we can do in when he goes back to the nursing home to decrease the stress, but to make sure that he's still able to have that pleasant experience. Um, so I would almost try and problem solve the return to the nursing home to try and get him that pleasant activity for as long as possible. Yeah, that sounds good, thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, so, while you were presenting and you were talking about the four stimulation types of each activity, should we be looking at planning activities that hit multiple stimulation types or even all four stimulation types? Does that make the, the activity better or is that really too overwhelming or does it really depend on the person? Yeah, I, I tend to give myself reasonable small objectives. And so personally, I think I would when I'm looking at the week, try to focus one day with one activity and one type of stimulation to not try to do too much and then kind of have too much, too much expectations around that one activity. Um, and so I would probably say that a balanced schedule where you do one activity per day with a different kind of goal each day, that would be kind of my way of doing things. Um, now, usually it's also um, good to be smart about um, how you plan around the activity. What I mean by that is um, try to go in an environment that is calm, right? And so whichever activity you plan to do, try to be in a calm environment. Try to plan the activity when your loved one has high levels of energy. And so if they're a morning person, morning might be a great time to do gardening. But if they're more of a late night, you know, um, uh, evening um, owl, they might, the afternoon might be a better time for them to do the activity. Also, in terms of timing, don't plan for like a three hour long activity. I usually aim for 15, 30 minutes. That's kind of um, as, you know, the concentration span that you can plan to have. If it goes longer, great. That means that you've found something that they really love and that they're engaged, but usually try to aim for like 15, 30 minutes. And then, um, as I mentioned, be patient. The first time that you introduce an activity might not be successful. Try again um, and, um, and, and just know that, you know, one day might not be a good day because they didn't sleep well, but it might be successful the next day if you try again. Oh, thank you. You actually answered my next question too, which was about the schedule and the planning. So thank you very much. <laughs> and now actually Marcia has a question and she it's about the books that you talked about specific for people with dementia. Do you happen to know any specific titles or is that easily found by Googling? How can they find those? Um, yes, um, there is a set of books that is called um, Nana's Books, and I can write it in the chat. And they um, they tend to be um, nostalgic um, and really helpful for people um, with dementia. And so let me just type out the answer. Nana's Books are um, one set of books that I like. Um, and then another set of books that I like answered and so I can't uh, let me write it in the chat maybe oh nope um there's another set of books sorry that is called Marlena's books so um if you uh if we want to google that those are also books that are designed for people um, with dementia with kind of simple straight storylines um and 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 large fonts Thank you. It's the the captions are on, and we should be able to capture all of that. So everyone will get it when they when they get the recording for that. So 
let's see what we have. We have actually just a comment from Erin who says, thank you so much for this webinar. It's been very helpful. And I do quite agree with that. This has been extremely helpful. So thank you very much uh, for everything. Uh, we do, B has one more thing that she would like to um, ask is about nail, getting nails cut and refusing. So that kind of reminds me of any type of grooming or those kind of activities. How can we try something with a positive outcome? Do you have any ideas around this kind of topic in general that you could help us with or any place that you could point us to to get that information? Yeah, um, so I will say that often nursing homes have um, come to their facility, people that are specialized in um, kind of nail grooming, but also hair you know, cutting. And so these are people who do this for a living to kind of put someone with the dementia at ease with the um, with the activity that's going to happen. And so I would definitely ask um, for help from from those uh, people who do this for a living. Um, and then kind of kind of just using a little bit of my um, uh, general knowledge, I would say, try to make it a pleasant overall experience. And so the question specifically was around cutting nails. But think about if you were to transform it into a hand massage of which one of the steps was nail cutting, but then everything else around it is pleasant and it's kind of getting your hand moisturized and it smells nice. You know, so if you can try and make the overall experience something fun, you might be able to then do the one uh, task that you know is a bit less pleasant, or you also might need to um, split it up in small steps. So you might not be able to do all 10 fingers in one sitting, but maybe do a couple fingers and then kind of go do something else and the next day do the remaining fingers. Maybe it's kind of sitting down for a long period of time. That is something that they don't like. And, and so try really to make it bite-sized. Well, that's great. And your suggestion turns it into a, a sensory stimulation as well yeah. too. So, so that's perfect. I'm sure that is very intentional. Well, you know what? It's, it's the top of the hour. So I don't, I, I know we want to be respectful of everyone's time. Marianne, thank you so much again for coming and talking to us and providing these caregivers with great ideas and activities and things for them, for their loved ones. We really appreciate your time. So everyone who's joined us today, thank you so much for being here. You will receive a link to this recorded webinar in the email that you used to, um, register for it. So look there. And if you enjoyed this webinar, you should definitely visit the website www.seniorlivinglive.com, where we have so many great webinar recordings. They even have podcasts about all the topics that you're looking for in senior living, including much more about dementia. So it's definitely a great place, a great resource for you. All of the videos are free about all of the topics about senior living. So definitely check it out. And yes, Bob, you will be getting an email of these resources and all of these tips when you get your presentation, you'll get a link and everything. So uh, make sure to check your email shortly. Thank you for watching. Thank you, Marianne, for joining us. And thanks everyone for being a part of Senior Living Live. Have a great day. Mm -hmm.